Good morning. Great to see you today. So we're going to be um, we're going to be continuing our series that Paul started last week called Chosen, and it's 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 about those disciples who were chosen by Jesus, but it's also just about us as well because we are we are chosen. And um, I love reading stories about amazing people. And I, love, I, love, I just love those stories. And we're going to read an amazing story today uh, from John 1, 43 to 51, about an amazing man called Nathaniel. But before that, we're going to just talk about a guy called Larry Walters. Anybody know who Larry Walters is? Anyone heard of Larry Walters? So Lawrence Richard Larry Walters had often dreamed about flying. He'd wanted to become a, a pilot, but because of his poor eyesight, he'd not been able to do it. But in 1982, he attached 43 weather balloons to the deck chair in his garden. He, he filled them with helium, he put on a parachute, he strapped himself in, took a pellet gun, a CB radio, some sandwiches, <laughs> and some beer, and a camera, and then his friends cut the cord to his deck chair, and he floated rapidly up to 16,000 feet. He was spotted by two commercial airlines. And as he slowly drifted uh, through the sky, he crossed the, the approach to Long Beach Airport. And as he, after about 45 minutes, he takes out his pellet gun and he fires two of the weather balloons on either side of his deck chair so as not to unbalance the load. And then, he, and then he drops his pellet gun and then he slowly descends to the ground where the balloons get tangled up in some electricity lines. At this point, there is a 20-minute blackout in Long Beach as he's knocked out the electricity in the area. And he eventually lands unharmed where he's met by the local police. He's arrested, fined, finishes his job, and he starts a lucrative after speaking tour. One day Larry Walters was just living his life. He was going to work, watching TV, going to work, watching TV. And the next day, his life has changed forever. It's a next day moment. If you want a title for today, it's next day moments. And he said he, he was interviewed uh, on national TV and he said, I just couldn't just sit there. I had to do something. And Nathaniel, who's only referred to Nathaniel in John's gospel, he's normally referred to as Bartholomew and the others, he had a next day moment. And he has a few similarities with Larry Walters. Not too many, but a few. He, you know, both had their flaws. Both had a passion. You know, Walters, he had a passion for flying. And both of them, their lives changed forever. So we're just going to read from John 1, 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one that Moses wrote, wrote about in the law, about the one whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Come and see, said Philip. 
And when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. But you will see greater things than that. And then he added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. We're just going to pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we pray as we spend some moments just unpacking your word. That you will bring fresh revelation about who you are. We thank you, Lord, that every day, Lord, you are knocking on the door of our hearts. You are calling us to that fresh revelation as to who you are. Help us as we look at this passage today, Lord, we pray, to know you more. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we see three times uh, in, in John chapter 1, it talks about the next day. John 1, 29, the next day. John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1.35, the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples and when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. John 1.43, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said, Follow me. And it seems to me that the next day is a, it's a kind of moment where, where Jesus begins to unfold revelation about who he is. It's how people begin to encounter him and, and know him until he reveals his glory. See, Jesus, for Nathaniel, he, he was just the son of Joseph, the carpenter. And you see in this short passage, you see how he begins to know and understand more of who Jesus is. He goes from the son of Joseph to rabbi, to the son of God, to the king. And ultimately we see Jesus revealing his glory. A next day moment is when you're going along in your life. You're just living your life. And then the next day, God breaks in. The next day moment is a day where, you know, you're, you're pushing into God and you're pushing into God until you get your breakthrough. A yeah. next day moment is that moment when you're, you're traveling along in one, in one direction and then you see Jesus breaking in. A next day moment is when you keep on going, when it's difficult, yeah. when you don't give up until you really press into Jesus. A next day moment is when you take a step of faith. And to everybody else, it doesn't make any sense. But in that secret place, in that place where you have been praying to God, he's been whispering in your ear and he's been whispering into your heart and saying, I'm calling you to this. And you take that step of faith. It's a next day moment. And Nathaniel, he has a next day moment and four things happen. Firstly, Jesus finds him. Secondly, Jesus looks beyond his flaws. He looks beyond his failings. Jesus, thirdly, sees his fervor. He sees his passion. And fourthly, Jesus reveals his future. So let's look at the first one. Jesus finds us. John 1, The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Verse 45, Philip found Nathanael. Nathanael goes to him and he says, look, we found the one that Moses was talking about, the one that was in the scriptures, the Messiah, we found him. It's, um, it's, it's Jesus, he, he, the son of Joseph. Yeah. And Jesus is in the business of finding people. He's in the business of finding people, but he's waiting sometimes for somebody to introduce him. That's our job. 
And Andrew meets Jesus and he introduces Simon. And what happens in his next day moment, Simon, you're not going to be called Simon anymore. You're going to be called Peter. I'm going to build my church on you. It's a next day moment. And for Philip, he, he introduces Nathaniel to Jesus and he says, come and see. Come and see Jesus. It's a next day moment. He's minding his own business and then the next day, his life changes forever. See, what's, why did Jesus go to Galilee? Why was Jesus going to Galilee? Because he was mindful that he was going to go to Cana in Galilee. And as he gets to Cana in Galilee, he's going to be, it's a wedding. And at the wedding, they're going to run out of wine. And all they're going to have is some jars for washing their feet. And Jesus is going to be mindful that he is going to turn that dirty water, that washing water, into the most perfect wine. He's going to reveal his glory. And for Nathaniel, for the first time, he's going to know that Jesus is real. And however your, fan, your friends or family or, or neighbors or colleagues are responding to Jesus today, just know that they're just waiting for that next day moment. Jesus is always working. He's always wanting to reveal himself and he just wants somebody to introduce him. And come and see is a great strategy. You don't have to be a, an evangelist. You don't have to feel confident about sharing the gospel or, or sharing your story. It's a, it's a great way of introducing people to Jesus. And Beth in our Connect group and Simone, they are brilliant at this. Come and see. Come and meet my friend over here. Come to this meeting. Come to this party. Come to this event. Come to church. They are absolutely brilliant. And when we have our Connect group on a Thursday night, it's full of come and see stories. And it's something we can all do. Come to an Alpha course. Come to a, this thing called Messy Church on, on Saturday morning. It's totally crazy. <laughs> it really is. But it's great fun. You know, Mark, next, uh, next Saturday night, Mark is sharing his testimony in Tiverton. Uh, oh, Sunday night, sorry. And um, it's, it, we're not saying, we're not publicizing Mark, okay? What we're saying is come and see what Jesus has done in Mark's life. You know, if you've read his book, you'll have seen that Mark has a next day moment. A, a guy in his, in his police cell, a guy called Matthew, I think, he just introduces Mark to Jesus. And then within a few weeks, months, you know, Mark has a radical change in his life. Just because somebody introduced him. Somebody just talked to Mark about Jesus. How many lives have changed because that man, that day, was brave enough to say, can I talk to you about Jesus? The people are just waiting for that next day moment, when that, that moment when Jesus is going to find them. Secondly, Jesus looks beyond our flaws. Nathaniel was far from perfect. He was um, cynical. He was um, prejudiced about people of Nazareth. Being a Mancunian, I've had plenty of that myself. He, he was proud. He was kind of creating these stereotypes. He was a bit to bl blunt and to the point. He was, you know, he, he called a spade a spade. Verse 46, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? And then Jesus, he sees beyond all of that. He kind of pushes all of that cynicism, all of that bluntness, all of that prejudice. He pushes it all to one side. And as he's looking at him in the distance, he sees him coming towards him. And he's walking towards him, and he says, of, he says of Nathaniel, Here is an Israelite, indeed, a true descendant of Jacob, in whom there is no guile, nor deceit, nor duplicity. That's the amplified version. 
You see, what Jesus is saying in that moment is, because he knows his, his history, he knows that Nathaniel is an Israelite, and the Israelites came from Jacob. They were the, tw- the, the 12 tribes of Israel came from Jacob, who was later named Israel. And, and Jacob was guilty of all of those things, of guile, of duplicity. He was cunning, he was sly. We see in Genesis 25 how Jacob persuaded his brother Esau to give up his birthright just for some hot stew. Can you imagine giving up your birthright for some beef stroganoff? Or some Lancashire hot pot? (laughs) We see in Genesis 27, 1 to 4, that as his father was dying and his eyesight was fading, he dresses up and pretends to be his brother to steal his blessing. We see in Genesis 30 that he, he's working for his father-in-law, Laban, and he's, he's managed this system, and I can't quite work out what he did, but somehow he manages to get all of the strong flocks for himself, and he leaves his father-in-law with all of the weak flocks, and then he wanders off with his two daughters as well. And the, the name Jacob means deceives, and that's what he was. He was a liar. He was a deceiver. He was all in for himself. And then we see in Genesis 32, he wrestles with God. He sees God face to face. And in that moment, God says, what's your name? And he says, Jacob. And he says, you're not going to be called Jacob anymore. You're going to be called Israel. It's a next day moment. One day he's full of lying and cunning and slyness and and deceit. And the next minute, he's got a new name and he's got a new destiny. You know, Nathaniel wasn't like Jacob. He was a bit blunt. He was, he was a bit to the point. But Jesus sees beyond all of that. I met someone the other day and he, we were talking and he said to me, I said, have you got a faith? And he talked a little bit about what, his, what he, thought, who, who he thought Jesus was. And then he looked me in the eye and he said, um, How could anyone love a scumbag like me? That's his exact words. And I said, Jesus can. And Jesus does. And a few minutes later, we were just praying as he was giving his life to Jesus. It was a next day moment for him. I said, how do you feel? He just said, I feel full of peace. I said, Jesus, he's the Prince of Peace. And he's going to give you his peace right now. And Jesus, before he went on his ministry, he was a tecton. And a tecton was a master craftsman in stone and wood. He would take these raw materials and he would shape them to make beautiful, amazing things from them. And that's what he longs to do with each of us. To take our lives into his hands and shape them to do beautiful and wonderful things for his glory. And he just longs for us to just place himself in his hands and just let him do the shaping. Thirdly, Jesus sees our fervor. Verse 48. How do you know me, Nathaniel asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree. On the face of it, that doesn't sound that impressive, does it really? It would be a bit like saying, sounds a bit like saying, I saw you on the high street the other day in Barnstable. I saw you on the beach last week. I saw you in Tesco's the other day. Or or other supermarkets are available. You know, he he already knew Jesus. He 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 was Jesus, you know, Joseph's son. But something in that moment gets his attention. Something in that moment makes him change his mind and suddenly the scales drop from his eyes. If we look at the Amplified Version, it says this in verse 48. It's the same verse. Nathaniel said to Jesus, how do you know these things about me? And Jesus answered, before Philip called you when you were still under the fig tree, I saw you. I don't think that Jesus is saying, I saw you under the fig tree. 
I think what Jesus is saying, I saw you. I saw your heart. I saw what you were doing. You were praying. And you were praying on your knees and you were praying, I want to see the Messiah. I want to see the Lord come. I want to see the one that the scriptures have been, have been written about. I want to see who that, I want to see the Messiah. I want to see the kingdom of God come in my region, in my area. Jesus saw him. Jesus saw his heart. Jesus saw his fervor. Fervor means intense, passionate feeling. Jesus sees your prayers. He sees your heart's desire. Those prayers when you've been on your own and you've been crying out to God, he sees every single one of them. He's heard every single one of them. Those moments when you have been absolutely desperate, when you could have not got any lower, he's heard every single one of those prayers. And when I was 10 years old, the Royal and West showground that wasn't for Creation Fest, it was for a thing called Royal Week. And it was a kind of low-tech version of Creation Fest with these high-tech things like overhead projectors. These modern things called choruses. And uh, as, we, as I was there that week with my family, throughout the week, uh, they, ser- they talked about Jesus and they serialized uh, this story called Cross and the Switchblade, about a famous story about a man called David Wilkerson, who as a young uh, preacher in Pennsylvania, he goes to New York and he goes to start to speak to the gangs of New York about Jesus. And one of the most uh, vicious gangs in New York at the time was the Mau Maus. And one of the most vicious people in the Mau Maus was the leader called Nicky Cruz. And one day, after many, many weeks, many months of David Wilkerson talking about Jesus, one day, he meets Jesus. It was a next day moment. And, you know, he, he became a hero of mine, really, Nicky Cruz, for a while. And I remember being 10 years old, we just moved to a new church where they had these amazing things called overhead projectors. And we sang these things called choruses and there was a band and drums and it was amazing. And somebody, one Sunday morning, they were talking about prayer and they said, we're going to just get into groups at the end of this and we're going to all pray for our heart's desire. And so I got into my little group with these other adults and But one by one, they began to pray for their heart's desire. And then it was my turn. And it's dangerous when you're 10 years old and you've just become a Christian because you you kind of believe that if you pray for something, God is going to do it. And so I, I prayed with all my heart that Nicky Cruz would come and speak in Manchester. And some of the adults, they said, they kind of laughed and they said, oh, isn't he lovely? Ten years old, isn't that lovely? And somebody said, who's Nicky Cruz? (laughs) Within a couple of years, Nicky Cruz came to Manchester. That ten-year-old fervent prayer was answered by God. What's your fervor? Why are you passionately seeking God for today? Because he's ready to give, to answer those prayers. He's ready to, he's hearing those those prayers today. What is God calling out of you today? It's interesting because I remember Nicky Cruz speaking in Manchester and I don't remember much about what he was saying, but in his broad kind of port. Puerto Rican, uh, kind of New York accent, quite hard to understand. I just remember him saying, you know, the Christian faith isn't for chickens. Excuse the kind of expression, but that's what he said. He said, it's not for people who are are kind of fearful and afraid and and want to sort of cower back. It's for people who want to go on the front foot. It's for people that want to step forward. It's for people who want to be courageous. And if, if we want to reach... Barnstable for Jesus, if we want to beat, reach Biddyford for Jesus, if we want to reach Ilfracombe for Jesus, if we want to reach North Devon for Jesus, we need to be courageous. 
we need to be willing just to take that step forward. And then fourthly, Jesus reveals our future. Verse 51, he then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus had seen those prayers that day. He'd been praying under the fig tree. I mean, fig trees were just, you know, it was the symbol of Israel. They were everywhere. But it wasn't that. It was, it was the fact he was passionately seeking God. And as we return to Genesis 28, and we just return to that story of Jacob, Jacob has a dream. And so Genesis 28, 12 and 13, it says this. He, Jacob, had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on earth with its top reaching heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. And I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Verse 16. Jacob awoke from the, his sleep and he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is a gate of heaven. Verse 19. He called that place Bethel, although the city used to be called Luz. For Jacob, that moment was a next day moment. It was the moment when God wasn't his father's God. It wasn't the God that he'd read about or heard about in the stories. It was the moment when God became real to him. It was the moment when God became actual in his life. It was the moment when God became his Lord. Pastor Andy Elm's been talking about this recently. He talks about the actuality of God, the moment when God becomes absolutely tangible in your life. Uh, Jacob saw angels in, uh, ascending and descending on a place, and he thought that place was awesome. He thought that place was holy. He thought that place was the place where God connected with earth. And what Nathaniel realized and discovered that day when Jesus saw him walking towards him and said, you're a true Israelite, was that it wasn't the place that was holy. It wasn't the place that was the connection between heaven and earth. It was a person. And that person is Jesus. Because in a few days' time, He's going to go to a wedding. And in that wedding, washing water is going to be turned into wine. And it says, in that moment, they believed. And I think for us, there's a, there's a wedding coming. A wedding coming, and in that wedding, there's that moment where God is going to bring in, break in and bring those next day moments. Do you know, I'm excited for Barnstable. I'm excited for North Devon and Devon. I'm excited what God is going to do, that God is going to bring next day moments. Perhaps it's because someone comes to an Alpha course. You know, we have got six beautiful people doing Alpha at the moment. And every day, it's like Jesus revealing more of himself to them. It could be a, a money course. It could be an invite to church. It could be bringing somebody to messy church. It could be connecting with somebody and bringing them to a, a, you know, a gathering or party that your connect group are putting on. But I really believe that God is seeking for men and women and children who are just going to put him first, seek him, and introduce him to people around them. 
He's looking for people, men and women and children, who are going to take that next step, step out in faith. And maybe right now, you know, your heart is beating because you know that the God is speaking to you at the moment. You know, he's knocking on the door of our hearts, it says in Revelation, because he wants to call out more from us than we currently, currently know and experience. So Jesus finds us. Jesus looks beyond our flaws. He sees our fervor and he reveals our future. What's going to be your next day moment? What is the next day moment which Jesus is just longing to bring? The breakthrough, the challenge, a deeper relationship, calling you out to do something more than what you're currently doing. Shall we stand? Dear Lord Jesus, we, we thank you, Lord, that you're a God of next day moments. Lord, you're a God of when we, want it, when we, when we feel like giving up. You don't give up on us. Lord, you're a God that when we, we've, got, we've been in our most desperate place, that you're right there. Lord, you're a God who, who finds. You're a God who looks beyond our failings and our flaws, our imperfections, and sees our potential. You're the God that sees our fervor, Lord, that sees our prayers, that sees our tears, that knows our deepest desires. And you're also the God of our future. Lord, help us just to stay, take to respond to your Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, not to hold back, Lord, but to put ourselves into your hands because you are the tecton, you are the master craftsman ready to shape our lives, Lord, for, to bring out the very best in us, Lord, and for your glory. So, Lord, we, we put ourselves in your hands this morning. And we just say, Lord, will you come afresh in our lives, Lord, today? Fresh in our hearts today? And I really believe that if if today that you have perhaps taken a few steps back or you've been just holding back, that Jesus is saying, come. Come and follow me. Come and follow my lead. Let me take you on a journey. Because there's a wedding coming. And I'm going to reveal my glory. You're going to see things you've never seen before. You're going to experience things that you've never experienced before. If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never done that, I would, I would invite you to do that. We're just going to pray a short prayer. Just echo the words after me. If, if you've never done this before, dear Lord Jesus, I need you. Forgive me for my sin. Forgive all the things that I've done wrong and come into my life. Come and fill me with your love. Come and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name.